Let us pray. A prayer for St. Augustine. Blessed are all your saints, O God, who have traveled over the tempestuous sea of this moral life and have made the harbor of peace and felicity. Watch over us who are still in our dangerous voyage. And remember such as lie exposed to the rough storms of trouble and temptations. Frail is our vessel, and the ocean is wide. But as in your mercy you have set our course, so steer the vessel of our life for the everlasting shore of peace. Bring us at length to the quiet haven of our heart's desire, where you, O oh our God, are blessed and live and reign forever and ever. First of all, welcome to Professor Anderson's class uh, <laughs> and uh, Professor Anderson. Um, as you know, we're in the second part of talking about uh, the formation of Christian moral life against the background of the emerging technoculture. And last week we looked at scripture and ethics uh, and uh, spent some time with Professor Cosgrove. Today we shift from worship and ethics, or we shift to worship and ethics. And uh, since uh, I know little about worship other than having to endure bad worship from time to time and enjoy good worship from time to time. I thought I could bring in Professor Anderson who actually knows what he's talking about. So his assignment today is to enlighten us on the relationship between worship and ethics or why Waters can't do his job without me. <laughs> So some of you, uh, some of you have headed United Methodist Worship, some of you have gotten United Methodist Worship now. You're going to hear some familiar things, but not exactly the same thing. Um, the, those who have had my class or, or can remember back to the first week will recognize that um, one, of the, one of the things I lay out in my first class lecture is, is uh, a set of tensions that we live with in, in Christian worship. One of the significant tensions being the tension between worship as formation and worship as expression or self-expression. And um, I, it needs to be balanced, but as, as some of you know, I tend to land on the formation side of that equation. Uh, so much of what I'm going to say today focuses on that, that specific question. What is, what is the relationship between worship and moral formation? Right. In the end, it may, be, it may answer the question why, why Waters needs Anderson do his job. It may not. We'll see. So Paul Waddle, in a recent article entitled Risking a Redeemed Self, Moral Formation in an Entertainment Culture, which I think Dr. Blackwise is going to reserve for you. Perhaps. I will. If that's kind of logical at this point. That's right. He just hopes to put it on his own. Waddle writes the following. Our entertainment culture is a system of moral formation. Because it captivates our attention, shapes our desires, forms our beliefs, attitudes, and perceptions, and habituates us in a way of being that suggests there is nothing higher or more important or more important than the self and its fancies. It is a system of moral formation that not only affirms but also aggressively encourages an individualism, self-centeredness, and penchant for self-gratification that can leave one casually indifferent to the well-being of others. He then goes on to say, in contrast, worship offers an alternative. Well, an alternative context for personal and communal formation than entertainment culture, because worship, in opening us to God, teaches us to risk a redeemed self. Worship is the ritual activity that gradually, and often painstakingly, reorients our lives away from the self and the self to God and others. Worship is the ritual activity that gradually, and often painstakingly, reorients our lives away from the self and itself to God and others. How does it do that? I want to talk about two primary themes in to answer that question. 
as well as this larger question of worship and moral formation. The first is to talk a bit about ritual and habit. So to think about how we inhabit worship. And the second, to, to steal a phrase from uh, the rule of Benedict, the founder of the Benedictine or monastic order, to talk about worship as a school for the Lord's service. So first, inhabiting worship. Minnesota essayist Paul Gruco, in his 1995 collections of essays entitled Grassroots, The Universal Home, provides a series of reflections on the importance of place and of home. He writes, to inhabit a place means literally to have made it a habit, <coughs> to have made it a custom, an ordinary practice of our lives, to have learned how to wear a place like a familiar garment like the garments of sanctity that nuns wore. The word habit in its now dim original form meant to own. We own places not because we possess the deeds to them, but because they have entered the continuum of our lives. What is strange to us, unfamiliar and therefore uninhabited, can never be home." End quote. We inhabit places, stories, and lives. We also have identities and relationships in our sense of comfort in and with ourselves, in the deep comfort we experience in the presence of those we love and those who love us. But notice the analogy between place and garment that Bruco sets up in his juxtaposition of familiar garments and garments of sanctity. In these days, when you can buy pre-faded, pre-torn, pre-washed jeans, Unwashed, unsoftened jeans, jeans fresh off the shelf seems something of an oddity. The fact that pre-treated, pre-washed, pre-torn jeans sell is at least in part because they give us the illusion of having been worn over time. The illusion of a life already lived, whether that life is ours or someone else's. This is the illusion that's created by the entertainment culture that Wallow describes. But Gruco seems to suggest that it is possible, even desirable, to live a holy life in ordinary, relaxed, and natural ways, like familiar, well-broken in genes, rather than stiffly and not uncomfortably. On the one hand, he suggests that such a holy life has a particular pattern and a fabric. On the other hand, it does not come pre-made for us. It comes with exemplars, but we can't buy it off the shelf. We have to wear our way into the life for ourselves. To, to inhabit a place, to become comfortable in it, is to give our hearts to it. All these are ways to think about how we receive the Jesus tradition. They are also ways to think about how worship forms us in Christian life, that is, to inhabit the place comfortable in the place, to give our hearts to the place. Paul uses some of these same images, and I really didn't borrow from our conversation yesterday. We put off the old man and put on Christ, or the old woman, and put on Christ. We take on the habit of Christ, an image that's reflected first in the church's baptismal practices and only later in the monastic practice. Right? The, habit, the habit of the Christian life is the baptismal practice. Everything else comes from that. Or, in his other letters, we let the word of Christ dwell richly within us. And we learn to let Christ be at home in our hearts as we learn to be at home in Christ. Or, as we hear repeatedly in the Gospel of John, we learn and live that we may abide in Christ as Christ abides in us. We learn to be mutually at home in one another. To indwell with one another. Well, to inhabit a place or a story is really to make it a habit of our hearts, a habit of our bodies, and a habit of our minds. Yet we Protestants are often suspicious of habit and ritual. Only grudgingly do we acknowledge that our lives are necessarily filled with good and bad habits, with ritual ways of acting in the world and in worship. 
our suspicion and supposed rejection of habit blinds us to the ways in which the practice of the Christian faith in our bodies, minds, and homes truly and really requires the development of habit and ritual. Now, if you think you worship at a congregation that doesn't have any habits, just because it doesn't have worship written down in a book or on a piece of paper or a bulletin, try changing something on Sunday morning. <laughs> Actually, the fact that it's not written down most likely will be harder to change because those habits are written in people's bodies and in their hearts, not on paper. Sometimes we only discover the habits of our bodies when we are confronted with practices that are new to us or that seem to belong to others. When we say, as I sometimes say, I don't bow or kneel, or especially, I don't clap or dance, we are giving voice to rules that are written not only in our minds, but also in our bodies, in our muscles, and in our bones. When confronted with such rules, we also don't recognize that when there is an argument between mind and body, bodies more often win. Yeah, how about those New Year's resolutions, huh? <laughs> the very point of disciplined practice that is, of worship, is to develop habits of, body, of mind and body. The very point of discipline practice, whether for musical performance, for athletic achievement, or for holy living, is to develop habits of mind and body. Catholic theologian Louis-Marie Chauvet argues that Christian faith cannot survive without religion and therefore without rights, R-I-T-E, rights. In this, he's claiming that faith is not about something primarily in our heads, in our intellects, although it does need careful thought, that's why you're in this class, but about practices, patterns of intentional action repeated over time that we undertake in order to cultivate and nurture the habit of holy living. Chauvet suggests rather helpfully for Protestants, I think, <coughs> that, quote, the demon of ritualism one pretends to expel returns at a gallop, bringing seven others worse than himself, disguised as dogmatism or moralism more dangerous and no less naive than the religious magic one wants to get rid of. Now you know the scripture text is pointing to the right one. The man with the legion of demons in him. I'll repeat that quote. The demon of ritualism that one pretends to expel returns to the gallop bringing seven others worse than itself, disguised as a dogmatism or moralism more dangerous and no less naive than the religious magic one wants to get rid of. You need the text, it's Luke 11, 26. One way to understand his point is to say that you cannot rid yourself of a bad habit unless you fill the space that formerly occupied with a good habit. Or, more simply, recount a TV campaign of you know, almost three decades ago, two decades ago at least. Just say no doesn't work. And that's a bad habit too. <laughs> the good habit is remember to silence your phone. <laughs> See why silence fine. I did. <laughs> Just say no doesn't work. say no to something unless you have something to say yes to. So a liturgical example. The United Methodist Baptismal Liturgy, like that of the Presbyterian Church USA, the Episcopal Church USA, and the Evangelical Lutheran Church, begins with a series of renunciations and affirmations. Now if you really want to learn about this, I've got a whole long paper that I did as a lecture in, in, uh, called Apotaxis and Ethics, which, which really explores that. The baptismal liturgies begin with a series of renunciations and affirmations. These renunciations and affirmations have a long history in the ecumenical church. The 
older than the creed. The point, though, is not their longevity, but what they help us to do in a ritualized context. They help us to say no and to say yes. The first question posed to us asks us to renounce the forces of sin and evil in our world and our lives. In other words, the first question says, now say no. But the second question, asked immediately, asks us to say yes to the grace and freedom given to us in Christ. So the United Methodist language, do you renounce the forces of the evil, the spiritual, the spiritual forces of the evil, the wickedness of this world? Right? The second question, do you accept the freedom and grace, the freedom and power that God gives you? Right? Do you say no, and do you accept this freedom and power? And then the third question is finally, and now, confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Right? It's predicated, our answer that our yes there is predicated not only on our no, but within the whole Wesleyan system that it reflects, is predicated on God's bringing grace. God's yes to us in Christ, the freedom and power God gives us enables us finally to say yes, to commit ourselves. God's yes to us in Christ gives us the ability, grace, and freedom for both the no to evil and the yes to grace. That's what the baptismal liturgy enacts. Right? I, when I talk about this with, with um, I, I often talk about the baptismal renunciations in the uh, inquirer's class at First Methodist. And one of the images I like to use is, is you, know, you know, we want to say yes and no. <coughs> right? we, think, we think we can hedge our bets. Right? And, and the image that, that, I, that I usually bring out is that you know, trying to say yes and no is like being tied to two horses going in opposite directions. And you know the result of that. It's pretty messy once they start moving. But if you start, I mean, some of you may know, uh, you know, know some things about psychodrama, which is an old therapeutic kind of process. But what's going on in the baptismal renunciations and affirmations is a kind of psychodrama, right? We are saying no, which means we have to let go of the one thing that we've committed ourselves to and turn all the way around in order to fully grasp onto the thing you're saying yes to. Now, in the early church, people physically, not only did they just physically turn around, they spat on the West, on the darkness, on evil, Right on Satan, renounced. You know, you can't, it's hard not to. You know, it's hard to find a more powerful form of renunciation than spitting on something, and turn all the way around. Now to press our faith in Christ, to face the, the way of life. So we renounce and we affirm. Yes, no, no. Yes, without a no. It's about the habit in our body. On the other side of our suspicion of habit and ritual. On the other side, once we get past that, once we come in maybe in Tillich's terms, or, or in Ricoeur's terms, to a second naivete, we discover a way of being in our bodies that has been trained through repetition to the point that what we do now feels natural. That is, we now wear the habit, the practice, the story, rather than resisting it. Such patterning in our bodies is less about ideas than about the pattern of our lives. Less about learning a text than about becoming a text. Less about intellectual knowing than about knowing experientially, phenomenologically, in our bodies. Thomas Driver, in his book, The Magic of Ritual, argues that the primacy of ritual, dance, song, silence, and prayer is characteristic of religion as long as it is vital. This does not mean that ritual is mindless, nor anti-intellectual, as some suspected of being. Rather, it means that its form of knowledge is more similar to that of the arts and to conceptual theology, more similar to poetry than to philosophy or literary criticism. Knowing at this experiential level comes not by shedding habit or ritual, but from a deep patterning into it. It comes by so fully putting on the habit that it now feels natural, as if we were one with it. This is the place in which our hearts dwell and are nurtured. Such knowledge, such ritual knowledge, you could say, is the kind of knowledge that comes with the singular attention required when we give ourselves over to prayer, song, and even to play. 
It is the kind of knowledge that comes from a, from a life that practices the faith one professes. From a faith written, inhabited in our bodies as much as it is in our minds. And it is only with such practice that we come to know deeply this way of life. One of the reasons you don't feel prepared when you finish three years of seminary is because you haven't had enough practice. Any of you know Malcolm Gladwell's book, Outliers? I'm reading about that. One of his chapters talks, uh, I don't know if it's called 10,000 Hours, but one of his chapters talks about, talks about 10,000 hours. And, and there's actually some hard science behind this, though, though Gladwell's just you know, he's, um, doing some popularizing of it. And the, the basic argument is it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert in something. When you think about, you know, trained musicians, when you think about, you know, Highly skilled athletes, um, 10,000 hours. Well, you know, an hour a week on Sunday morning, you know how long that will take to become an expert? 200 years. When you start to think about monastic traditions that are at prayer 20 hours a week, think about how that shapes, that changes that. It's been demonstrated, you know, with, especially with, you know, with, with, uh, with concert musicians, but also with star athletes. 10,000 hours. Think about it. How much practice do you have? How we speak about the habitual nature of ritual and the religious life. How we speak about the ritual action through which we experience worship. How we speak about what we experience in our bodies and embody in our lives reveal some of the problems we face when attempting to talk about the relationship between worship and Christian formation. We tend to separate the two. One is the place and form of ritual action, and often reserved for adults. The other a kind of intellectual or sometimes pseudo-intellectual activity, an activity of the mind rather than the heart, and often for children or youth. But in Chauvet's claim that religion needs ritual practice, and in Driver's claim that ritual practice is characteristic of all vital religion, we are reminded that an incarnational faith, a faith that professes belief in an incarnate God, requires attention to the ways in which our bodies, minds, and hearts are trained, patterned, habituated to see a world loved by God. So what I'm suggesting here is that the ways in which we learn to embody our faith through worship, and this is partly going to your answering your question, the ways in which we learn to embody our faith through worship determines, or at least conditions, for good or for ill, and there's a lot of ill determination sometimes in worship, our way of being in the world, in our communities, and in our families. Worship, therefore, lies at the heart of Christian moral formation. It's about the shaping of a worldview. The ways in which we embody our faith in ritual practices, the ways in which we learn to inhabit our faith through word, washing, and holy meal, are all means by which we come to participate in a particular worldview, not just learn about it, but to actually participate in it, and to participate in a particular set of relationships that are both incarnate and transcendent. I often wonder how such formation can happen Formation. How, can, how can it happen through worship when both prayer book and non-prayer book type of worshiping communities increasingly turn worship into a kind of didactic event. Words, 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 talk, 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 for some kind of, some kind of emotional uplift and self-improvement, or when it's turned into a staged event enter, intended to entertain us, or when it is parceled out among age-appropriate learning events called children's church. You want to know why the church has a generation gap? Just look at its worship practices. Right. Who's in worship on Sunday morning? Where are the children? Where are the youth? Why is it you expect the youth to re suddenly reappear in worship after confirmation class when you've been dismissing them from worship for the first 14 years of their lives? No. There's lots of preaching that can happen. <laughs> More, it's hard for anyone to inhabit the Jesus tradition 
If one's only exposure to it is by way of a baby in a manger or a crucified and now absent prophet, those Christmas and Easter people. You know, you think one hour a week, that's, you know, two hours a year. It's worse. Without constant dwelling in the rhythms of the church here, which necessarily requires the rhythms of the combination or seat class, I told you there's some current United Methodist worship stuff. Without constant dwelling in the rhythms of the year and in the common lectionary, we have no context for understanding, much less living out, the good news of the incarnate, crucified, and risen Savior. And without the steady rhythm of the church year, through which we tell and retell the Jesus tradition, we become powerless in the face of social, political, and economic scripts that promise but can never deliver the true safety, freedom, and joy of comfort that we seek. The answer is not, let's go shopping. Rather, let's go to worship. Our suspicion of ritual and habit as Protestants has led us to believe that we can somehow learn to worship, or learn to act faithfully, or learn to act morally, or learn to act virtuously by talking about it in explanation and commentary. This is why Waters needs me. <laughs> yes, such explanations are necessary for our growth. But they better enable us to become theoreticians rather than practitioners of the Christian faith. To know about the Jesus tradition rather than to inhabit the Jesus tradition. Shaping our minds is only part of the story. A necessary part, but only part. It is in loving and being loved that we learn to be loving persons. It is in acting morally that we learn to be moral persons. It is in worshiping that we learn to be worshiping people. We learn these things most deeply by putting on the habits of loving, acting morally, so, so much for habit and ritual for the moment. So, a school of worship. We're on moving with all of us. Worship then is a school for the Lord's service. It's the phrase from the Benedict's rule. It is a school for the Lord's service in which we put on the habit of worship. In speaking of the monastic life, as a school for the Lord's service. That's how Benedict uses the phrase. The monastic life as a school for the Lord's service. Benedict sought to provide a framework in which a community of persons might join together in a common life and discipline to seek the way of God, to live into the way of Christ, and to pursue Christian holiness. And he said it once more. He sought to provide a framework in which a community of persons might join together in a common life and discipline to seek the way of God, to live into the way of Christ, and to pursue Christian holiness. He invites men and women into a way of life that, as it is lived, teaches the way of Christ and assists in inhabiting that way. For Benedict, the monastic life was only a means to that end. They weren't being formed in order to be monks. They were monks in order to be formed in Christ. My understanding of the formative role of worship is not much different. For most Christians today, corporate worship is the primary sustaining discipline or practice of the community. At the very least, it is the most public, and perhaps because of that, the most dangerous. While our various churches engage in a variety of ministries and services in our communities, the one practice that distinguishes us from all other service agencies is our gathering for worship week in and week out. We gather at least for it weekly on the Lord's Day. There's a whole theological commentary I could add there. Sometimes on Sunday evening and at midweek for prayer, testimony, and song. So how then does corporate communal worship teach us and inform us in the way of Christ? How is worship a school for the Lord's service? How is worship a practice, a formation for the Christian moral life? Well, I've got a list of approaches and implications and consequences that are about to come. So first, three approaches. First, to the extent that we think about what a school is, we might think of a school as a particular place, even a building or a group of buildings to which we go for instruction. Now, those of you who are primarily computers know that it's difficult to inhabit this place because you're computers. What does it mean to inhabit this place as a school, as a place of learning? In such places, we generally think of learning as, a, as acquiring a particular skill or body of information. We learn how to do something, or how to think in a certain way. In some cases, we think of schools as places in which we are preparing ourselves 
for some later action or work. We learn how in school, we apply it later in our work. So in this sense, school is not only a place of instruction, but also a place of preparation for something that is yet to come. Worship schools us then by shaping our imaginations, our desires, and our hopes. 